Sofers have one of the hardest jobs in the world. Most of them have the entire tour memorized, and they have to write the entire thing with natural ink and feather as a quill. Also, if they mess up once, they have to start all over. It's an insane job. That is crazy. Jesus Christ. Jews of Brooklyn, New York are the most religious and closed off community in America. What is Hasidism to you? So it's a very vibrant community, second and third generation post Holocaust. Arguably one of the most fundamental religions, period, on the planet. This community is a wonderful community because there's a lot of nice people here. The whole system of how we relate. This guy's a YouTuber. To God and how we interact with God. This shit's cool as fuck. Um, the, the, the block thing that you put on your head and then the, the leather thing, the leather wrap on the arm does look dope. It, you look like a, like a legionnaire, which I feel like is inappropriate to say, but it does look kind of sick. I'm about to walk into an exclusive synagogue here and I'm pretty nervous. Wow. The stakes are very high for outsiders to be here, but I'm about to cross into this controversial bubble to discover the untold truth, which will leave you speechless. Don't, can you not record this part? Okay, got it. It's gonna be a disaster with cameras, but we're gonna try. Excuse me. I'm gonna rush, I have an appointment. I never thought I would feel intimidated by my own religion. The security everywhere now in this neighborhood. Pretty intense street, very, very religious. Everybody on their flip phones because they don't use internet. 100% of the women over 18 years old are wearing wigs. What are you supposed to think or believe in this moment? So that's a really good question. Growing up Jewish, I've always enjoyed connecting with other Jews around the world, like I've done in Ethiopia, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and Yemen. I consider myself very lucky to be part of a religion that has only 15 million members, but has such a profound impact on global society. That being said, I've always been extra curious about the Hasidic Jews of New York because they seem to be different both physically and mentally from the rest of us. The Hasidism so movement physically? started just 250 years ago in Ukraine and spread to the United States right after the Holocaust. The way that Hasidic Jews dress themselves and curate their lifestyles will leave you stunned, from their big furry hats and long beards to their lack of using the internet and smartphones. Their strong commitment to family, tradition, and strict Jewish law is remarkable. Yeah, he spoke to Zebulon in Afghanistan too, I But think. let's back up a bit. Not all Jews. One of my favorite, one of my favorite Jewish people of all time is the remaining, the remaining Jew in Afghanistan who just like, specifically refuse to leave Afghanistan. Like, I don't give a fuck. You're never getting me. You're never getting me out of here. <laughs> like, no matter what. Jews are Hasidic. In fact, Hasidics make up only 5% of the total Jewish population. There are three other movements. I think he moved to Israel Reform, recently. Yeah. He moved to Israel, Israel after. No, he didn't and pass away. He moved to Israel. can be found scattered around New York City. He finally I left, I started my adventure by popping into a Jewish restaurant in Washington Heights, Manhattan, which is a local hangout spot for modern Orthodox teenagers studying Torah at the well-known Yeshiva University. Is it mostly Jews that come here? Mostly, yeah. We have a bunch of teachers and people from around the neighborhood that come also, and some, some regulars. These chicken shawamas. The best part is that he hated the only other Jewish guy? Yes, and they contested. Not dissimilar to the, uh, to the Hasidic Jewish uh, dispute that we're seeing about uh, who actually owns the, the, the Chabad house. Uh, there was the, the last synagogue in Afghanistan that they were disputing over. And uh, one of the fun uh, parts is that they, the last, um, so, so Zebulon was arrested by the Taliban and was put in prison. And then they released him from prison because he fucking annoyed everyone. He like constantly duked it out with everybody. And then they literally had to release him from prison, according to the documentaries and, and news articles written about him. It was awesome. He's the goat. Anyway, let's so continue. So it's homemade. We make it every day with fresh chicken. We cut up ourselves the chicken, spice it up, stack it. That looks so and cook good. It. Yeah. It's almost sounding, caramelized. Are you from Israel or no, I'm from France. I grew up in France. I, I thought I heard I something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're French Jew. Yeah, yeah. I don't meet that many French Jews. Like yeah, I know. No. Is, my workers are the best. Literally, like, really amazing, amazing worker. Speak like you're Israeli. Yeah, French guy wearing a Golan Heights shirt. Saying, this is, you know, this is my shawarma. I know. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of the French mix it's, in uh, there. After all these years working in the Israeli restaurant, I think it literally, like, uh, yeah. imprinted me with the Israeli accent. Um, from oh, Chile. the takeaway is called Golan Heights? I've never met a Chilean Jew in my entire life. 
Do you, do you feel like you belong here, like with the Jews and the community? I believe the community here is amazing. I believe that all Jews belong, belong in Israel. It's not just sure that's the name of the restaurant? Oh, nice. That is pretty tasty. Everything in a shawarma that I would ever possibly want, including eggplant, is in here. Very fresh. Went to this place when I asked for the Mediterranean salad on my wrap. They really corrected me to, do you mean Israeli Flavorful. salad? Very delicious. Mm. Go in that building over there. A lot of French Jews are of Sephardic Algerian origin. So yes, shawarma is an actual native dish for him. Yeah, except like, no, you, why did you say this then? Like, okay, he's a Sephardic, Sephardic Algerian origin. It's not a French dish. It's an Algerian dish. There you go. That's my point. This is the whole point that I make all the time. Okay. Arab Jews and Mena Jews are Mena and Arab. Okay. They're not Jews as a, like a, a separate thing. This inherently comes from, and, and a lot of people repeat this without recognizing that like there is an inherent bias in it. Like, of course, Judaism being an ethno religion implies that there are a shit ton of different cuisines from all around the world, right? From all around the world. It's just that to slap it as like, this is Israeli cuisine is what is incorrect about it. Do you know what I mean? It, or saying that this is Jewish cuisine is like a weird thing to say about it because... It, it's not supposed to be Israeli or Jewish cuisine. It's whatever the, the, uh, wherever the Jewish person is coming from. Like, that is where it, it, it originates from. Not that it fucking matters. Shawarma is not Algerian? Yeah, I, I know. I, I'm just... Shawarma is not Algerian or North African. Yes. Shawarma is not Turkish either. No. Shawarma is the, is the, I guess, what is the origin of shawarma? I would say like Iraq maybe. Um, Dunar is the Turkish version of that. And it's the best. Or Syrian is the Levant. It's from the Levant. Okay. Anyway, let's continue. That's like the big yeshiva. And you have like hundreds of kids studying together. Really? Tell me about this community. Shawarma is a Turkish word? No, it's not. This is what we call a modern Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. A little more um, takes uh, like modern inventions and technology and incorporates it into Jewish life as opposed to a Hasidic neighborhood, which may not do so. What do you think about Hasidic neighborhoods? They're not like any more Jewish than us. They're not any less Jewish. We're all Jews and like the way, like their teachings are Oh, are Chevy de Man. Like it's not really for everyone. Oh, really? Wait, shawarma comes from Chevy de Man? Wait, no fucking way. Hold up. No, I think you guys are doing, I think Turks are fucking uh, doing the classic everything is Turkish shit. Oh my God. Oh my God. It is Turkish. Oh my God. Yo, get fucked everybody in the chat. I thought Donar was like specifically Turkish and I didn't realize that. I, I thought that like, oh my God, this entire time people were like, shawarma is not a Turkish word. And I was like fucking eating that shit up. Bro, all the fucking, all, oh my God, all the Syrians and the Arabs in the chat, dude, get fucking wrecked. Originated in the Levant region of the Arab world during the Ottoman Empire because it's like a meat cut into thin slices stacked into an inverted cone. Donar was invented in Berlin. No option to shawarma. Bro, if you fucking say this in Turkey, they will put you in a cannon and launch you into space. Are you out of your fucking mind? Donar was invented in Berlin. Are you insane? No, motherfucker. Donar was not invented in Berlin. No. Turks that immigrated into Germany brought Donar with them and it became like an, a beloved German dish as well. That is the most insane thing. It's like thinking fucking Indian food was invented in England or something. We've invented curry, mate. What you fucking mean? I know, chicken tikka masala. 
I know. Turks visited Berlin in 1997 and brought Donut back to Istanbul. That's so funny. Mexicans invented Pastor the fuck? No. That's not true either. This, I, I'm almost certain, this actually, this as a concept originated in the Levant region, uh, right, under the Ottoman Empire, inevitably moved over, inevitably moved over to Latin America. Shawarma is an Arabic rendering of Ottoman Turkish chevirme, referring to the turning, rotisserie. But yeah. Um, I think like Al Pastor is, is also, it goes back to the uh, Mexicans or Turks uh, thing that I say all the time, which is real. Yeah, see? The origins of Al Pastor can be traced back to Middle Eastern cuisine. In the 19th century, Lebanese immigrants brought the technique of spit roasting meat with them to Mexico. There you go. Yeah. Um, I've been on an Erasmus trip last year, and Turks and Syrians who were on the Syrians who were on that trip argued the whole time about food, both claiming they invented it. Yeah, this is a age old tale. I do think it's funny that there is like anyone in the chat that tries to fucking claim that Germany invented it though. Okay. In Israel, most shawarma is made with dark meat turkey, commonly served in tahin sauce instead of yogurt for kashrut reasons. It is often garnished with diced tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, pickled vegetables, hummus, tahina sauce, sumac. Like, I reluctantly will admit, okay, there is a new spot that I found in Los Angeles, okay, is in Studio City, straight up. And it's an Israeli, I think it's an Israeli spot, okay? And it's actually kind of fire, okay? Like, I think that cultural uh, cross-pollination, it, it can be good, okay? I, I love tahin sauce. And not tahin, tahini sauce, sorry. And this place, Avi Q, is actually fire, okay? It's actually fire. My favorite restaurants in Los Angeles are also uh, run, owned, and operated by an Israeli couple, Bavel. Not Tahin. The, tahin is the Mexican spice blend law. Listen, in Turkish, it's uh, Tahin. So that's why Tahini is Tahin. Right? Isn't it? Bavel. Bestia, Safis, all owned by the same, all owned uh, by the same uh, Israeli couple. And it's gas. Bavel is incredible. And so is Safis, really. Safis has some of the best donut I've had in Los Angeles. <sighs> Pop up specialist AviQ has gone legit in a Studio City strip mall selling shaved Wagyu pita sandwiches and more. I mean, it's pretty good. You know, fair is fair. I'll say it. So, you know, I'm not going to fucking act like that's not the case, but, uh, you know, shawarma invented by the Turks. Just saying. But the people who it's for, like, it worked for a lot of people for thousands and thousands of years. So, uh, it's a really beautiful thing. I happen to be Chabad. I'm... It's different. I'm, it's Chabad different is a totally, yeah, and they're different Hasidic groups. But you guys have no beef with each other. It's all Judaism. They tend to be a little bit more insular, and for their reasons. From their religious perspective, they're trying to protect, you know, what they're doing, and um, they don't want the... I mean, this guy's dripped out the fucking wazoo, bro. This is what I'm saying. It's like, come on, dog. He, he's dressed up like a peaky blinder, you know what I mean? I mean, it's fire. ...to necessarily influence them. I mean, there have been conflicts, so I'm not going to lie. But, like, you, would but you wouldn't go there, and they wouldn't come here, put it that way. Uh... Yeshiva University is a little bit controversial in that sense. Like, okay. Samar Fasid would not hold of Yeshiva University. They don't, they don't go to secular college. They don't sure. go to secular university. It's really cool to see Hebrew writing all over the walls. Like, I can actually sound it out, but I don't know what it means. 
Now that I've got a good feel for the modern Orthodox life in Manhattan, I'm hopping in a cab to the ultra-conservative Hasidic community in Brooklyn called South Williamsburg. Unlike other Jewish communities, most Hasidics rarely, if ever, leave the boundaries of their district. Every Ottomans aren't only Turks, you ignorant Turk. Shut the fuck up, bitch. Everything from schools, hospitals, and supermarkets to hardware stores, internet cafes, and bookstores are all found within walking distance. It is very much a bubble and it's intimidating to enter because A, I'm not Hasidic, and B, I'll be meeting up with Abby Stein, who comes from Williamsburg but was canceled by her parents and her family for coming out as transgender. I was the first person who was raised in a Hasidic community in the 250 years of the Hasidic community's existence. This guy's sick. Come out of the worst thing that happened to me. Like, I thought this guy, like, he, he, this seems like he's. When I've come back here, has been people screaming. Like, and once people threw eggs. Like, did he say canceled? Canceled is an interesting word for it. I mean, still, like, humanizing a, a, a former Hasidic uh, trans Jewish person is, like, kind of cool that, like, you don't see YouTubers taking that initiative ever. You know what I mean? Like, think about that. Think about, think about a YouTuber that you got Tyler Oliveira on the one hand, okay? You got Tyler Oliveira on the one hand, and then you got a guy like Drubinsky on the other hand, who's like pretty fucking, um, who, 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 I mean, this is like incredibly open-minded. Threw an, an egg at you. I'm going in with an open mind and a willingness to learn more about this YouTube. Drew has come a long way. I'm not going to lie. I filmed him in four countries and he's a good dude. Just not very informed on a lot of stuff, surprisingly. Culture while being extra careful on how I use my camera. Hi. Hi. How are you? On, uh, dude, 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 listen. Listen, real recognizable. This shit is drip, okay? Is is dripped out the motherfucking wazoo. Okay, it, it's just, it's, it goes hard. It goes so hard. All, that's all I'm saying. It's just, it goes hard. Uh, sometimes there is a, that like, uh, Hasidic Jews have to bring it uh, with them in a box, right? Too, like, there's like a special box for it. Not to get it like fucked up. If you ever take the hat off. I've seen that. Like, there's, like, a hat box. Celine hat. It, it drip is crazy drip. No, every every part of this is, is it, sick. They are called strimals, not furry hats. I'm not Hasidic, but if I recall correctly, it's made out of fox fur. It's fire. <laughs> Durag and strimal stream when? At both at the same time. Like, this is kind of sick, right? Um, what do I mean by this? It's like, it's like showing your, like the Mormons have like, uh, the Mormons have the, the special underwear, right? Like that you, <clears throat> that you wear in temples, which is cool. But then like, you don't get to showcase it. Whereas I feel like the more, the more leveled up you are, it's like armor. The more leveled up you are in religion, the more you you show your armor which I think is sick. You know what I mean? This is like, yo, this is plus 10 faith. Like, I have a fur hat that's plus 10 faith. You don't have a fur hat. You only have the regular hat. You haven't upgraded. You know what I mean? It's, it's not cosmetic. It's not. Uh, many people think like, oh, this is just cosmetic. Like, no, this is not pay to win. You have to literally level up your religious points to be able to get the specific armor I'm just saying, it's fire. It, it is exactly like a video game. They're playing Fashion Souls. Yeah, no, they're, they're doing Faith Max build for sure. Yeah, you wear it everywhere. As soon as you get clouded, go on a mission or get married. You never take it off. Exactly. Exactly. It also shows you fuck. That's the other thing. Like, dude, dude, you see... A Hasidic Jewish guy without the fur hat? That means he don't fuck. Because you get that when you fuck. So it literally is just a flex on the haters, okay? Think about that. It's literally a permanent flex. It's like, yeah, you can spot me from a mile away, dog. I fuck. Look at my, fo look at my, look at my hat. It was made out of fox fur. There's like 10 grand, 
Okay. Yeah. It's like you're flexing on the haters and you're flexing on the little virgins in the in the fucking community when they're like, oh, I don't have a wife yet. And it's like, yeah, bitch, you don't. I do. Okay. What happened in No Swearing 2024? Okay, I'm just saying, like, I don't know how else to describe this situation. Okay. So... Bro, my hat was $600 that I got for starting Hasidic Rabbi College from my Rav. Shit was fire, not fuzzy. See, that's what I mean. You got a, you got a straw hat. Not a straw hat, but, you know, not a fuzzy hat. It's cool. Okay, Mugiwara. Yeah, I mean, look, every community has a signifier, Okay. Like, in this community, you can show how many months you avoided the top of the hour ad break with a subscription badge, right? Like this guy, or this lady, sorry. Uh, Six-month subscriber, seven-month subscriber, showing off the badge. Kev Rhino, three-and-a-half-year subscriber. Tier two for 44 months. Like, these are the different amenities that every community has, right? At the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break, and many ad break avoiders get to showcase how long they've been avoiding the ad breaks at the top of the hour, how long they've been subscribing at the top of the hour, right? With a with the sub badge. Like, everybody's got a different way of flexing on the haters is what I mean. Here's a three-minute ad break right now. By the way, you can also avoid the ad break by subscribing for $5 or for free with the Prime or by getting gifted a sub. If you're lucky, all right, let's continue. Sorry. Food, and Abby is eager to take me to one of her favorite childhood restaurants called Come on, Gottes. Drew. It's important to know that all food around here is kosher, which is a strict eating code that Hasidic, Orthodox, and many other Jews follow. It's kind of similar to halal food for Muslims, in that animals must be slaughtered a certain way to be able to eat them, all forms of pork are forbidden, and you cannot mix meat and dairy. In the 1930s, there were over 1,500 kosher delis in New York, but nowadays, that number has dwindled down to about 20, as the Jews have spread around America. Gottlieb's has been a lifeline for Williamsburg Hasidic community since opening its doors 62 years ago, and the cuisine is all derived from Eastern Europe. All right, no cheeseburger. Okay. Should I show you? Yeah, you go, ahead. go yeah, ahead. Yeah, bro, you can't fucking drown. Okay, you cannot drown the, what is it, like, what's the term for it in kosher? You cannot drown the baby in the mother's milk or something. That's why you can't mix uh, dairy and meat, which is probably one of the biggest L's. Like, I think kosher, halal, not having pork is kind of an L because there's no bacon, no gabagool, none of the fucking Italian meats, okay? But... Um, with, with kosher, you can't like, you also can't do the, the mixing of the dairy and the meat. And I feel like that's a, that's a major L. <sighs> Give me a rundown. Rice, rice, potato, mashed potato. Very common, very Eastern European, as you can see. It is here. very Eastern European. There's two kinds of goulash. You got sesame chicken. That's very popular. With that. So that's actually one of my favorite things here. This is also amazing. Ooh. Stuffed cabbage is one of my favorite things as a child. One, two, three, four, five. You get six kinds of kogos just here, and it's not even Friday. I'm into Chicken everything, so how, it's I'm, all amazing. You want to just order oh, for me? Oh, that is soup. Yeah, I want to see the soup. Oh my god, it's a lot of soup, my friend. Oh yeah, there's a lot. That's my favorite. Those are the noodles, amazing. It's not so boiling a kid in its mother's milk. Damn, I got it right, dude. I'm. Yeah, I'm okay. with it. I know uh, my shit. Vegetable. Everything in it. Then there's something over here. Chicken gizzards. What's your favorite? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> He's being very nice. Can I ask you a question about payas? Have you had that your whole life? Yeah, of course. Since I was three. Since you were three? Yes. But for you, it's been normal your whole life? Of course, of course. I have my kids as well. And my, I have my eighth boy. I'm going to make payas now on circus before circus. Your eighth boy? Eighth boy. How many boys do you have? I have eight boys. And girls? One girl. Are you always this busy? I'm always busy, but I'm missing one guy who's making a wedding tonight, one of my guys. And then one of my guys on vacation, so... Hello, how are you? Can I have a picture from me? I would love to, yeah. Uh, What's your name? My name is A.B. Baby. Where are you from? I'm a Willie boy. Really? Yeah. Do, do you like this restaurant? Of course! Who doesn't like this restaurant? This community is a wonderful community, because there's a lot of nice people here. Look at Yitzchak. Take a look, Yitzchak. Take a look, Yitzchak. No, don't take a look. Take a look, Manash. Yeah, he likes Could you find such a guy like him? So life is good here. Life is great, especially when I meet you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. 
these two, their oh, kids, their but he kid. said that that- Broke, that's fire. Dude, come on. Dude, you can't beat that. Like, like, it's not just- You don't just have the hat. You have to protect the hat. Are you kidding me? Come on, bro. He's got a rain cap on the hat, dog. Bad guys. Mechitzen means that their kids are married to each other. As a community, you're quite Wait. close. Oh. Along with the men, it's, it's this. Wow, it's, you know what it is? It's all in Hebrew. It's a Torah. Okay, it's the blessing you make after eating. I think we're both oh. just getting the two right. of us. Just put it down. Matzah soup. I haven't had oh, matzah ball soup in a long time. <laughs> well, if you come on Friday, I will make. It's also like a rainy day, so it's even. It's, it's even better. It's like a fall day. It feels like a home cooked meal. This looks extremely Eastern European, almost it's like you would find good. in Ukraine or Poland. Steaming off the top right there. No, not incest, not incest, like uh, fucking uh, families, like different families marrying into one another. Mm. In -laws, it's filled with chat. meat, cabbage, onions. It's My grandmother was from, from Jerusalem, she put rice in it as well. Oh, uh, yeah, there is rice in there. Oh, there's rice there. It's right. so, 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 so good. And it's pretty filling too, because it has rice and... It's like a soup. It has a starch and a protein. It's like a soup and a dumpling. What is this one? That's um, sesame chicken. Okay. I'll have some of that as well. Yeah, please. Dig in. This is like Asian style, no? I was well, about to say, like that's got to be, that's got to be the, the deep cultural ties that the Jewish community has a Chinese food, I assume, right? Very interesting. So I, I have learned recently that um, there's a lot of overlap between Hasidic food and Asian food. And I think the reason for that is actually food developed out of poverty. Mm. And they, they made you, that's it's why you Polish? get the Wait, really? Very popular. Chicken heart. They eat that in the Philippines. This is the cold schlish because it's very similar to gnocchi, kind of like the pasta, true. but it doesn't really have a... Thing. It's not cheese. Mm -hmm. It's like... There's nothing dairy here. Oh, I should have pointed out. Oh yeah, There's absolutely it. nothing dairy here. You can't miss. So this is... This is a meat restaurant. This is a typical cuisine of Williamsburg. Yeah, meat. Well, this is a fantastic meal. Thank you for taking oh, me here. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm, I'm concluding that this part of the video. Don't worry, it's all gonna get eaten. She's a Jewish mother. Let's the see. The only real way to insult me is by not eating food. <laughs> this is so, so fucking much. cozy, dude. Holy shit. Hi, oh, sir. Like having a big, non-political or apolitical YouTuber be this cozy and this humanizing of a trans person is huge. Oh my god, this guy's awesome. Like. Straight up. Uh, is this there. Tyler Oliveira? No, fuck no. It's not Tyler Oliveira. Zagazin. Oh, there he's in Zagazin. Be well. Be well. That's Be well, Zagazin. Zagazin. <laughs> as soon as I walked outside the door to that restaurant, I could start to feel the culture sinking in as Abby and I walked the streets. All eyes were on us, and I felt a lot of pressure to keep my camera down because it's clear that people here do not want to be filmed. Don't record this. Okay. So I'm going to ask some people on the street right now if they want to be interviewed. Hi. Thank you. The only people who accepted to be interviewed were non-Jews, and it was pretty interesting to hear their perspectives on the Hasidics. If there wasn't here, it would be another ghetto. But I, I feel the tension between us all my life. I went to school here, but it's peaceful. If it wasn't, if they weren't here, then it would be an, an extension of the ghetto. How you doing? Hey, come here for a second. What do you think about this community? I don't consider this to be a religion. I consider this to be a culture. I've been working for them for almost 17 years. And, and every community, there's bad and good things. Hey, nobody's perfect. The only perfect is the one about. So I don't want to be a party pooper, but if he doesn't mention what women have to go through, then it's pretty incomplete. I, I suspect that there will be that element to it as well. I, hey, I respect, assume. man, respect. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm feeling like this tension building. The stakes are high. You know, Abby can't be seen. I can't be I seen. I can't be seen. <laughs> well, people just gonna look. Can I shoot from the window from the street? Yeah, well, technically, legally, they can't stop you. So I know. I you can. Why do many modern New York Jewish people really dislike the Hasids? Um, I, I mean, it's most likely because it's uh, not dissimilar. Uh, it's not dissimilar to how, like, some of the more fundy uh, Muslims behave. Like, globally, online, the the uh, Islamic, like, the, the Muslim Twitter will globally dunk on, like, uh, UK Muslims, for example. Because there's, like, a lot of, a lot of UK Muslims are just, like, kind of embarrassing. Like, not all, obviously, but some UK Muslims are a little embarrassing in the way that they, like, in the way that they are super fundamentalists.
so it's just uh it's 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 like that i think i assume I used to to live next to a large Hasid population in Baltimore. They don't speak to outsiders in a kind of rude way to see why people don't like them slash the vibes. Yeah. I've met Wahhabis that were more progressive than the weirdo Salafis, English Muslims. Yeah, there's like a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of like weird vibes and attitudes. Big reason is that they're also anti-vaxxers. There are not infre infrequently large measles outbreaks every few years. Yeah. That's why, that's how I found out about Jacob Kornblow uh, originally, who was like, uh, he's like an Orthodox reporter who would report on a lot of like the, the you know, anti-vaxxer stuff that they were doing uh, in the Hasidic community. Like they literally surrounded his house. They were like trying to fucking kill him and shit. It was crazy. There's like, there's like a, uh, like a Hasidic Andrew Breitbart, basically, who was like leading a a, a Hasidic mob to uh, surround his apartment. It was wild. The COVID was wild. They caused problems in the city. They're obnoxious anything, and they love Trump. They are conservatives. Yeah, they're conservative. Like they're fundamentalist conservative for the most part. That's what it is. It's just fundy shit. This is a cinema transferred into a synagogue. Almost. Like they they while out, you know what I mean? Is Libs a TikTok Hasid? Um, she's Orthodox. Everything about this community fascinates she's me, but nothing more than their restrictions to use the internet. It's a gathering to be saved from all the dangers of technology. So anti-internet. Anti. -internet. anti Technology, which is, yeah, that's pseudonym for the internet. This place is called Cubicles, and it's literally kosher internet. So basically... Oh, you go, yeah, you go in, you pay per hour, or half hour, whatever. Like an internet cafe in other yeah, countries. Yeah, an internet cafe, and you get filtered or slash kosher version of the internet. So it's like North Korea. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm gonna go in. Try to go in. Would you hold, hold this? I was not wanted in there. Let's go. <laughs> no, they just saw my camera. They're like, what, what are you filming? Let's go. I'm fully Jewish. I had bar mitzvah, everything. Last name is very Jewish. But I'm, I'm not welcomed in this community, which is very fascinating. I was told as a child that in, in school by my teachers that walking into a reformed temple is worse than going into a church. And you have to go... <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. That's so sick. That's that. See, there you go. There's your answer for the chatter who was watching. Like, why do why do a lot of like secular or reformed Jews in New York uh, get annoyed with uh, the Hasidic community? Well, there it is. Yes, going into a church is a horrible thing. Yeah, going into a reformed temple is even worse. <laughs> It's so interesting that all these shops are mostly food. You will see later a lot of children's stuff. Yeah. A lot of children, a huge percentage of the community of children. Yeah, because there's so many kids. You said people have 10, 15 kids. I, sorry, my parents have 13 kids, and it's on the bigger end, but it's not crazy large. 13 is not crazy to you? You have 10 grandkids, and you're not even that old. No, you don't have to be old to get married at 18. You have a child every year. By the time you are 38, your son is already getting it should be said that not all Orthodox Jews are the same. The New York community is extremely isolationist. Other places are less so. Yeah. I would say that in my experience, like Lakewood, New Jersey, and this specific uh, Hasidic community is significantly more insular than the, uh, well, I guess it's not even like Hasidic, but the Orthodox communities in Los Angeles. The Orthodox Jewish communities in Los Angeles are like very, is, is much more, uh, is much less isolated. Getting married. When you're 40, he has two kids and two, two grandkids. So it's normal, it's normal to have 20 grandkids. 20 is a joke. My father has hundreds. We are now entering the heart of Hasidic Williamsburg. Okay, let me rephrase. We've been at the heart the whole time, but until now we were in a part that also had government housing. Okay. So it ends up being a lot of people who are not Hasidic. From the BQE until Flushing Avenue, 100% of the people living here are Hasidic people. This way. 
This is a sofa. They ride the Torah scrolls by hand. Oh, cool. The Torah is a compilation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and it's written in a long scroll that all Jewish temples or synagogues have inside them. The Torah represents the totality of Jewish teaching, culture, and practice as instructed by God. When all Jewish people turn 13 years old, boys or girls, they have something called a bar or a bat mitzvah, which is a ceremony where they read a verse in the Torah to officially become an adult and be held accountable for their own actions. My bar mitzvah was on June 12, 2004, and it was a day that I'll never forget. Sofers have one of the hardest jobs in the world. Most of them have the entire Torah memorized, and they have to write the entire thing with natural ink and feather as a quill. Also, if they mess up once, they have to start all over. It's an insane job. That is crazy. Jesus Christ. Your Orthodox do not do bat mitzvah, only bar mitzvah. Okay. It's, it's right here. Oh, it's, it's right here. Right this, here. This. You're not comfortable. And you have to bury the mess ups. Like, people can't just throw them out. <laughs> How can you tell? Okay, this is uh, Abby's dad's up? synagogue right here. I'm trying not gonna stay here very long, but I respect you for taking me here. That's bizarre. So this is a big synagogue. The one okay. Coming up. Yep. So this is now the rabbi of this community. Now it's my uncle. Are you comfortable? No, I'm not. I'm just walking by and okay. walked to that bridge. Wow, these synagogues are intense. I never thought I would feel intimidated by my own religion. <laughs> it's such a weird feeling. So my family doesn't wear any wigs at all. So all my sisters and my mom and all my aunts and everyone. They shave their hair and then cover their heads with just a scarf. Wigs. Oh. No, no wigs. Wigs are too much. They shave their head. Shave bald. Them. Shave bald on a triple zero. That's the other part that I think is very important for you to realize. There are some beautiful parts, but I think it all gets wiped away by the fact that people can choose. For people who want to choose this way of life, I will fight for their right to choose this way of life. Right. That's what they want. But right. the reality is that most people don't have a choice. It's your whole life. Maybe. Why is there no Israeli flag? They're anti-Israel. They're extremely anti-Israel, trying to say. I, I, this whole community is extremely anti-Israel. I was shocked to... I told you, like, uh, the Orthodox community... The, uh, the Orthodox community goes e in either direction. The one thing that they align on is, like, being super conservative, okay? This is something that I've stressed before. Like, it was a bit of... In anti-Zionist circles, it was a bit of a faux pas to point to the Netarai Karta at least in like the last 10 years, I would say less so now because of like how wild, uh, sometimes Netarai Karta and other sects get specifically on their anti-Israel, uh, commentary. But overall, like some of the, some of the, uh, ultra Orthodox Jews, are very anti-Israel because they believe that the accurate, uh, the accurate interpretation of the Torah implies that Jews are a nation. Jews are not supposed to have a nation state uh, until the Messiah comes back. And then there are, of course, other ultra-Orthodox Jews that are super pro-Israel. The tunnel guys are on our side? No, I, I don't know. I don't know which sect it is to learn that some Hasidics have mixed feelings about Israel. I mean, remember the Yeshiva University student that I just met at the Israeli Grill? I believe- Yeah, it goes either way. In Israel, there's a massive ultra-Orthodox Zionist community, and in the next 40 years, they're predicted to constitute most of the population because their families are so large. Yeah, but then there's also an ultra-Orthodox uh, anti-Zionist. Like, some of the, some of the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel also are the ones that live in Jerusalem that constantly duke it out with the fucking cops that are like- pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist. And uh, those are the dudes who always fucking duke it out with the, with the IDF and the Israeli police regularly. Like when you, whenever you see like, whenever you see a bunch of uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, Jews in Jerusalem getting beat up by cops, they're the ones who are uh, super anti-Israel, right? But then you also have the ultra-Orthodox Zionist Jews who are also seen as like uh, weirdly contentious. They have a weirdly contentious relationship because like, again, Israel as it stands currently, the Israeli Jewish population is very secular. They're very uh, like, they're, they're progressive, I guess, in many different respects, whereas the ultra-Orthodox Zionists are not. So they not only are 
they not only are are uh, uh, Zionists, they also comprise of like the settler population, and on top of that, don't serve for religious, uh, don't even serve in the IDF because of the uh, religious exemption that they get. So it's like very, it, it, it's like frowned upon almost. Like there is definitely, like obviously as we've talked about before, as far as like um, Zionism goes inside of Israel, inside of the Israeli Jewish population, the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews are obviously pro-Israel's expansion or Israel dealing with Hamas or dealing with Palestinians across the board. But there are some uh, deviations. There are some uh, uh, distinct features within uh, Zionism in Israel where, uh, you know, a lot of people obviously don't give a shit about, like, leveling Gaza, as we have seen uh, from the polls. But then there also are, like, but we still want to do gay stuff, for example, and don't like how uh, religious conservatism is, is, is basically taking over the government without recognizing that the religious conservatism can only take over the government because of the reactionary attitudes that the overwhelming majority of Israelis have towards, Israeli Jews specifically have, towards uh, the Palestinian population. And uh, beyond that, like I said, it's just like, it's seen as like hypocritical that the Haredi Jews like don't serve in the IDF, which is seen as also, again, a secular institution, while simultaneously... Uh, taking up a lot of the resources of the IDF by uh, engaging in, like, settlement expansion and constantly, like, uh, making life living hell for the West Bank Palestinians. And there are definitely, I would say, liberal Zionists or, or some Zionists in Israel amongst the Israeli Jewish population that consider the West Bank expansion to be gross and disgusting and, and see those guys as, like, psychos. They even, as far as I've seen, I have a very funny way of shitting on uh, those uh, uh, like expansionist uh, settler uh, uh, Jews in, in West Bank where they call them Christians. <laughs> like that's like, a, that's something that I've seen uh, when, they, when they talk about some of the, some of the, I guess, messianic Jews or uh, some of the Jews that are uh, invested in like settler expansion, like the settler uh, uh, Jews, they... They call them Christian. That all Jews belong, belong in Israel. But Abby is telling me that the anti-Zionist Hasidics are from the Satmar sect, who make up the majority of South Williamsburg. Zionism is a movement for the development and protection of Israel. The Satmars believe that establishing a Jewish state before the arrival of the Messiah is a violation of Jewish law. When will the Messiah come? Who knows? But until then, you will not see a single Israeli flag on these streets. We all pray every day that we should return to Israel, but uh, a holy one, like uh, yeah. one that is, that is, we want to see divine power, not some, you know, just tanks and missiles. There is a school bus with Hebrew writing on it that's parked right in front of an actual school. No English, just Hebrew. Look at that security, that looks like I'm in a, like a Islamic country and there's a checkpoint. A security and, well, that's all Jews, all Jewish place in New York. Yeah, because it's gone up since. Chabad schools across the world do not celebrate Israel's Independence Day. They are adamantly opposed to the national anthem. Hatikva, even waving an Israeli flag or having one in a Chabad center is frowned upon. They have lives Terrorism. since Pittsburgh, yeah. yeah. Now, since the Pittsburgh shooting. Starting your eyes means not looking at people who are not just mad. Oh, it's not just the idea of most of the ultra-Orthodox population doesn't work generally which creates some political tension between secular and religious groups as far as welfare goes. There's an ultra-Orthodox conservative parties like the Shahs that are also weirdly fight for lefty economic reforms like raising the minimum wage. Yes, that is another part that I forgot. Like, uh, they, they, see, they see the ultra-Orthodox population as like uh, welfare queens as well. Like, they, they look at the rest of the Israeli society looks at, they, they see themselves as like way more progressive and look at the ultra orthodox community as like um, as a burden, as an economic burden. They like, why are we taking care of them? Why are we why are we funding the settlements? And why are we defending the settlements? While simultaneously, like obviously, not having that big of a problem with the IDF, loving the IDF as a secular institution that they hail as like the defenders of Israel because they're Zionists. They simultaneously, it's the land of contradictions. I don't know how else to describe it other than the very same contradictions that you see in American politics, you very much see in Israeli politics as well. It's because when left unexamined, settler colonialism, 
will inevitably lead to such contradictions that you hold on to inside of you without even recognizing that these two ideas don't go along with one another. And then before you know it, you're like, how the fuck did this become a right-wing shithole? And that's exactly what is going on in America. And of course, in America's extension, Israel. That's it. That's why it's like so similar uh, in, in commentary because you're like, on the one hand, you're like, oh, I want to do gay shit and I want to... Uh, like talk about Tel Aviv as like a, a place where, you know, the number one job is being a DJ and doing ketamine and having gay sex. But then also at the same time, I kind of want to do ethnic cleansing in Gaza. You know what I mean? And you can't have those two ideas in the same fucking mind. Like you can't, you can't be like, I'm actually a, a such a progressive guy, but also simultaneously, I think like ethnic cleansing is tight. That's happening like a mile out from where I live. You know what I mean? The difference, of course, is that I think in the United States of America, at least, like, there is a more prominent, um, I don't know, there's a more prominent, like, critique of, of, of American imperialism amongst, like, the, the left than there is in Israel. Also, the Haredi community is growing insanely fast compared to secular Jews. It's families with 10 kids versus families with 2 to 3 kids. They don't serve. They get money to study in shul, basically. And this is what will become a growing problem. It's like the Israeli version of the migrant scare in Europe. Our survivors, they look down on them. And a bunch of them are so poor, they have to go and beg for expired food at night. Yeah, I did not know that as well. Yeah, that like I had no idea that the Holocaust survivors in Israel were treated so poorly. Um, what is this? SVPBerlin.org. Okay, well, Elant News, you sent me a, a, a German article. I don't know about that. It's in English. A culture war is being waged in Israel over the identity of the state as guiding principles and relationship between religion and the state. And generally over the question of what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state, the ultra-Orthodox community of Haredim are pitted against the rest of the Israeli population. The former has tripled in size from 4 to 12%. Yeah, let me tell you something, okay? Let me tell you something. To all the, to all the, the, the supposedly progressive Israeli Jews out there who, like, think, you know, we got to do... We got to keep doing the bombing campaign, okay? Guess what, dude? The more you continue with hyper-nationalism, the more the Haredim will inevitably take over and take away all of the nice little civil liberties that you thought you had, that you took for granted. And it's going to happen, okay? It's going to happen. But, of course, much love to the actual Israeli left, the, the you know, the, the tiny... A uh, group of people in Israel that are uh, protesting against the anti-Zionist uh, Israeli Jews, and of course uh, the Israeli, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Obviously, um, they see the problem, and I see them as uh, united in the same struggle because it is the same. You know what I mean? Like. It's like me trying to fucking describe to American hogs or even American, supposedly American progressives who are like, except, you know, I'm progressive, but also like America is, is kind of cool as the world police, right? Those progressives who I categorize in a similar way to how uh, supposedly progressive Zionist uh, 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 Jews operate in Israel, Anyway, let's continue with this video. Not looking at non-kosher. So they're going to help you believe something? I they're going to help you guard your eyes. No, they're going to help you with advice and ideas. They're not trying to convince you to believe. They are, this community is not much into um, convincing people who don't believe to believe. It's more about people who believe, but like people who struggle, people who sometimes watch porn or like stuff like that, but they believe that it's a problem. They help you 
So they think nobody watches porn here? No, they know that some people do, and that's exactly what this is for. How did this community start? Okay, so the Hasidic movement was founded by actually my direct ancestor. His name is Rabbi Israel Ben Eliezer. My father's father's mother's father's father's mother's father 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 created founded the movement i was taught from a very young age to be very proud of it he lived in a small village called mezhebish in ukraine okay so the, the area that's now ukraine had millions of Hasidic jews before the holocaust okay. the vast majority of them were killed sure. by the nazis so this this community was born af right after the war after the holocaust yes they, they and, came here they in, settled here in many ways as a result of the holocaust i think it's amazing how these immigrants of holocaust survivors are still able to practice their traditions in new york the same way that their ancestors did hundreds of years ago in eastern europe walking these streets makes me feel like i've entered into a time machine back to the 1800s it is truly remarkable right now i'm eager to step inside a synagogue and learn from the ways that hasidics pray but i'm out of luck in williamsburg where the strictest rules apply to outsiders abby tells me about another hasidic district called borough park where the chances of me entering a synagogue are much higher as soon as we arrived i saw one out of the corner of my eye but abby chose to hang back with the cameras so i went in alone with only my iphone it's not click it's hard to explain the feeling of being Matt in that Pack synagogue, was YouTube? surrounded what by Hasidic Jews engaging in their most important duty, prayer. Some might say I'm intruding, but I feel like it's my duty to unlock these stories for you guys to see with the hopes that we can all appreciate diversity. On that note, I'm heading into a local shop to get myself a yarmulke, a Jewish cap made of cloth and worn by men to honor God above them. So what we would wear, and what's most common, mm -hmm. is this is called a six slice. So these are bigger, and they cover more of your head. Mm -hmm. and then like if you were considered more modern, Hassan, you said it's anti-Semitic to say Jew own everything, but how can they afford so many child? Yeah, famously, the more children you have implies the wealthier you have in modernity. You know, that's why, that's why famously all of the developing nations where they're having population problems, right, are, are actually very poor. That's how it works. Yeah. Brother, I don't know if you know this, but like, uh, you know, having multiple children is almost always and almost always both historically and certainly in developed society, uh, in, in developed nations, uh, a, a indication that you're not actually doing all that well. It is a, it, it has a direct association with poverty. <laughs> Hassan, how come Aya Sophia look like this <laughs> and not this? You get one of these, which is just four pieces. That's like so funny because that's also extra funny because like people will be like, uh -huh, how can you say people in Gaza are being ethnically cleansed when their population has exploded? And it's like, yeah, dude, that's not, I don't know if you know this, but that's not a telltale sign of like an exactly robust and developing country. Okay. Kind of the exact opposite. Got it. Smaller, cover his life. You think it's too small? That's perfect. perfect. Okay. He says it's perfect. It feels. It feels right. I've worn a lot of keepers in my day. I've never done this one, so it might take me a second. But let's see. Check you going, girl. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. The shofar, everyone. How many shekels? <laughs> <laughs> now do I look? Do I look a little more respectable? Now you look like you look like modern orthodox. Like you can pass as a modern. It changes record. everything. This it changes, changes everything. It. Specifically, this kind of keeper it changes everything. So Abby and I have discovered a ton of magazines, all in Yiddish. This is a weekly newspaper. Oh, that's that's three of these. It's about the same Wait, size. So most people don't have internet. They just use this. Yes. Instead. And it's big. And then you got like okay, so some of these are monthly magazines. Like these are monthly magazines. These are weekly. This is also something that can only exist without the internet. Well, this looks like it's just photos. It's literally just photos. It, it's page six. Yiddish is an offshoot of German that was started by Ashkenazi Jews in the 9th century in Central Europe. Sadly, the language was nearly extinct Would you blow due to a show the Holocaust Fuck yeah. when 6 million Jews were murdered by Nazi Germany from 1941 to 1945. These murders were carried out in pogroms, riots, and mass shootings, as well as forced labor and gas chambers a, within concentration camps. It's a wild as, change of pace that he just dropped into the middle of, like, otherwise a kind of fun video where he was just like, and here's the Holocaust. Auschwitz, which is the saddest and darkest place that I've ever been in my life. 
Some 85% of all Jews killed in the Holocaust spoke Yiddish, or roughly 5 million people. And today, that number is a mere 600,000. If you ask me, it is surreal to hear Yiddish being spoken in the United States today. This is like really common. People will just come and buy a magazine yeah. and take it we home. Buy, we used to buy like one of those newspapers several things every week, yeah. Look at this. I feel like... Did Hasan Abbas see Sam Cedar saying he wants to work out with Hassan? Are you kidding me? That's incredible. I would love to do that. Um, but also, uh, as far as Yiddish goes, like from what I understand, this is another like weird cultural thing with uh, the the Zionist nationalism project, where like the revitalization of Hebrew was uh, obviously it, it's like a phenomenal feat in linguistics, okay, in language, um, except it, of course, would be, as a standalone thing, it would be seen as, a, as awesome, you know, but it came at the cost of uh, a lot of ethnic cleansing, which is not so awesome. However, from what I understand, um, it also kind of, uh, it also kind of eliminated Yiddish I don't know if it's like it, it goes back to the same like we don't want to be associated with Germany in any capacity attitude. I don't know if it's like seen as an extension of the same thing that we talked about before within like Zionism and the cultural uh, the, the cultural forces within Zionism treating Holocaust survivors or Holocaust vi like victims of the Holocaust as like weak and that Israel is strong. And it will never happen to Israel again. That's why Israel has to be like very militant, which is of course uh, ahistorical and wrong and kind of gross, really. But uh, from what I understand, it's like Yiddish is is seen as uh, not great. Like the 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 revitalization of Hebrew came at uh, at. Basically, a suppression of Yiddish. Hassan, this is borderline Holocaust denial. The revision, the revisionism of Yiddish mainly and obviously came from the Nazis killing most Yiddish speakers and not the Zionist project. No, obviously that played a significant role in it. But as far as I understand, there's a reason why a lot of the Yiddish schools... And like a lot of the Yiddish being spoken globally now is done in America and not in Israel. Oh, sorry. How you doing? Obviously, the video just uh, mentioned that. I you didn't say that. Like, part? I'm trying to figure that out. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude. <laughs> I love that the chatter is yelling at me, but it's like, it's like considered the exhibit Palestinian in Yiddish chronicles the integration of Yiddish with Arabic and its literary rise and violent suppression in pre-state Israel. But then also like, um, as far as I understand it, like uh, David Ben-Gurion, who would soon become Israel's first prime minister, then spoke to the crowd in Hebrew. A comrade has just now spoken here in a great in foreign language, he declared. Ben-Gurion's shocking remark was a part of the pattern of denigration expressed by advocates of modern Hebrew within the Zionist movement during the pre-state years. It aimed to delegitimize the Yiddish language using violence, intimidation, and propaganda. A year after its establishment in 1948, the state of Israel banned Yiddish theater and periodicals under their legal powers of control material published and presented in foreign languages. Where's that? I know I'm not... I'm trying to do better by not yelling at chatters, which I'm not going to, but... It's a, it's a ridiculous thing to state that uh, I am engaging in borderline Holocaust revisionism when talking about something that I've read about uh, Zionism and its uh, distaste. And, and potential association with the Holocaust in and of itself. The other thing that I also mentioned, the other thing that I also mentioned specifically uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with Zionism and it's like, uh, and it's reinforcement of like being militant and, and being strong, like the invocation, the, the myth-making of like being a strong and oftentimes militant nation also comes at a cost 
oftentimes the cost being that uh, there is a a very weird association of like Holocaust survivors and also victims of the Holocaust that is borderline ahistorical as though they did not resist, as though they were weak, as though they uh, knew that they were going towards their deaths, marching towards their deaths and just like kind of let it happen. That's the other side of the militant uh, Zionism. It's very, it's very messed up. But it is something that I've seen. Roll the video back 10 seconds to see something funny. <laughs> Wait. How you doing? You know what it says inside? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> Anything emergency happens, people don't call 911 at all. People always call them. I memorize their number. It's uh, 718 so it's like the See? Shoreham Search and Rescue. I mean, it's, like, it's like an emergency That's what room. people call. Yeah, that's what people call. So. Is it like a trust issue? Like they want to be with other... It's a mix of a lot of things. It's a bit mix of trust. It's um, They are. They, they usually arrive faster. They don't charge. Oh, really? It's free. Okay, it's now free. I understand. Behind me, there's a Hasidic mother and a Muslim mother next to each other pushing their kids on the playground. That's cool. What's it like to live in this like Hasidic community? It's rough because it's kind of a closed community but it's got its beauty it's got its innocence it's uh really different than the whole world but it's it's really cool i'm hasidic i'm sorry so dude. yeah it's all good so yeah i grew what? up hasidic so why why this because <laughs> it didn't work for me obviously and uh, i went on my own i went on my own path my own journey but there's nothing like home there's nothing like coming home and uh there's literally long-term community members who are i think former hasidic jews too right isn't there there's one a lot of love right now? there's an awesome community but it's it's definitely got its got its rough red like parts later in the day i met up with barry weber the most who shared some pretty cool insight about his people so the real meaning of the word chassid, which means someone who does more than what justice demands from you. The movement of Hasidim started off with uh, Rabbi Yisrael Bashem, and the purpose of that is... As an ex hasid I really appreciate you showing all this to chess so people can actually learn instead of either being anti-Semitic or Zionist, bullshit people that think. Just to yeah. reveal the presence of godliness into the world, instead of us always trying to find where the holiness is, you become part of that. Your body is the vessel of your soul. The sun is getting ready to set, and Abby wants to take me to a legendary Judaica bookstore from her childhood. It is so impressive how these old-fashioned bookstores are still thriving in this day and age. I am 99% certain- What if this makes people more anti-Semitic? What? Bro, what do you mean? Who are you gonna call Jew busters? And then you turned around and said, what if this makes people more anti-Semitic? I guess you were talking about yourself. Chatter, answer for what you said. Chatter's like, what if this makes me more anti-Semitic? Which, you know, I, I'm already bordering on it uh, currently with this, with this uh, joke. And that's a couple who got married within the last week. So they're week. still getting to know each other. You can tell, Bo, by the way, they're walking Just apart from each other. Just a bit of banter. Okay, take a, we'll take a day off. Think about um, that. Rethink your the night, priorities. After the night of the wedding, you're not allowed to touch for seven days until they go to the mikveh. Oh, and it's a long story. So these are yeah, it's like, yeah, I watched a YouTube video up that, like, uh, dives in in a very like humane way into a insulated and fundamentalist uh, religious community, and I became more anti-Semitic as a consequence of that. Which you know I already was. I, oh, I think I was joking around with the local ambulance group. I know that's why I took. That's why I only give them a day off. Children's books, all of them in Yiddish of all kinds. You You're proud of Yiddish. I'm very proud of Yiddish, but it's like these things are made today for people who read it. Is this really the 21st century? TV special for a dollar ninety nine. I can see through the window that the bookstore is busy and intense, and I'm debating whether or not I should go in with my camera. Luckily, the owner came outside and invited us in to learn about the books and the items that are sold here. Right now, I'm in the largest bookstore here. It's fascinating. Um, it's really beautiful in here. We have all different kinds of books, all in Hebrew and Yiddish. It's interesting because they don't have internet on their phones, so they come here to learn, to study, read books, magazines, newspapers, CDs. That's fascinating. 
Morty gets. I grew up in Borough Park, so when I grew up, this is where I spent most of my time. This was always like the book central. It's not a library by the full description of what a library is, but it sure. serves as a sort of library for children. How would you describe Borough Park and this specific community? So it's a very vibrant community. It's just uh, second and third generation post Holocaust. So the rebirth is amazing. And I think the younger generation is not as aggressive sure. as the first generation, but the first generation felt it as an obligation to the rebirth, you know, six million white dead. They felt they have to rebuild that. Do you know the significance of that? Significance of payas. So the commandment is to have to leave some here on both sides of the head. That's a biblical and political commandment. It became more of a tradition of having us remember that we're part of this community. So it became more symbolic than the biblical uh, commandment. It became more of a symbol of a dress code. What's it like to live here? I love this place. There's nobody ever sleeping. It's always stuff going on here. Do you uh, have any siblings? Yeah, eight. Eight. Yeah. Wow, so you come here to get all your information yes. for stuff? So this is a, this is a shofar collection? Yes. Is this from a, a deer? One. A ram? A ram. So this one, uh, people from the Middle East, uh, like Yem the Yemen, they have large, large ones. Ashkenazi Jews mostly have the smaller ones. Why do Jews blow shofar? So it's a commandment in the Bible that at the beginning of the year, we should blow. Yeah, I was wrong about calling what you say Holocaust or Visionos, but I feel like we're not putting enough focus on the Nazis. The suppression of the Zionists wouldn't have gone that easy if not for them. I've seen a lot of people focus more on Zionists doing this than the Nazis. Wait, what? Because everybody understands that what the Nazis did was like the worst crime of all time. And it's more so shocking for Zionist Jews to do that to other Jews. That's that's what it is. Also, we're specifically talking about the evisceration of Yiddish. Notice how these guys in New York care about rebuilding. And that's why you have like Yiddish cultural centers and stuff in New York and in America. Because they wanted to combat uh, an evisceration of of an entire culture and language. Like Israel could have done that too, but they I feel like they have a distaste for Yiddish, possibly because of his German roots. I don't know. Or possibly because they see it as like something that goes against um the the uh social cohesion that they wanted to instill within the nationalist project of Zionism. You know what I mean? Because Israel, or at least Zionists, want, in my opinion, to kind of erase a lot of the other 2,000-year historical artifacts of the global, international Jewish population from all different, all different parts of the world because they want to turn it into one singular nation-state mythos specifically Israel, okay? That's the same principle behind, like, saying this is Israeli food, right? And not talking about the different uh, cultural roots of said food, right? Like, that's what it is. It's like uh, a lot of, uh, at least from what I see, a lot of the... KKK Hassan can't post links, but yes, it is a negation of the diaspora. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it almost feels like if you are, if you have any, any sort of roots to anything other than like what benefits the Zionist project, like 2000 years of history, 2000 years of Jewish history is great. As long as it culturally plants you in Judea and Samaria. Okay. As long as it's culturally like you'll find a coin or something and be like, see, this is my, you know, family's ancient coin that they found in a cave. And that's why I, Benjamin Netanyahu, belong here, right? Like, that's fine. But if you're talking about like your Hungarian roots or your Hungarian culture, it's like that's, that's almost like frowned upon and, and not seen as a, as a good thing. Does that make sense? Blow with the chauffeur.
It's Hungarian. Makes sense, though. No, Benjamin Netanyahu's family is Hungarian originally. It's like a, it's a, it's, it's nationalism. It's hyper-nationalism. I feel like the coin example was a really bad chosen one. Why? Like coin or fucking swords or shit like that. And no, the coin example is not a really bad chosen one. It's a specific one that like Benjamin Netanyahu has done before. It's like, uh, it's artifacts of being like, look, this is. My family's original roots. Now, the irony, the irony, of course, is that like, and I've said this before, if you look at the Palestinians, right? Like a lot of the Palestinians that are, that still consider themselves to be Palestinians that are Muslim or Christian have been in that region for a very long time. Some of them can trace back their roots all the way to like the original Christians too. However, the other thing is like, there's plenty of Palestinians there that like converted. You know what I mean? Maybe the hundreds of years ago, but like they are the, like a lot of the, the same Palestinians that are being slaughtered by the Israeli state are unironically the, the Jews that remained, some of which converted. Yeah, the coin thing was literally something BB did at CPAC. The Talmud explains it as if to wake up people from the dream once a year to do tshuva. <laughs> repent on their sins. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. In those times, that's how people used to, like, armies used to be reminded, like, wake up, so it was a wake-up call. This video isn't complete until I experience a Shabbat dinner inside of a Hasidic household. For those who aren't aware, in Judaism, Shabbat is a day of rest that happens every week from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. During Shabbat, it is prohibited to work, to drive a car, to use your phone, and even to turn on the lights during these holy 25 hours. All of the activity takes place at home, talking among family and friends, praying in the synagogue, and eating a massive meal. While I don't keep Shabbat on a regular basis, I do love to participate and I always enjoy this peaceful day of rest whenever I get the chance. However, bro, he didn't even fuck and he's got the fuck hat. I'm just saying, that's a little. For filming a Shabbat dinner no, inside of a Hasidic home is nearly impossible because it goes against the principles of not working. Let's just say that it took me four months to get permission from a rabbi to film the Shabbat dinner that you're about to see. He the approved my mission valor. to document in good faith and share the beauty of Hasidic culture the only one if hat? I do. The, the the fuck hat like when you when you get married or go on a mission but when you get married you get the hat the the furry hat the fuzzy not touch hat. or address the camera beyond sunset after several failed attempts is it would have flex on the haters my friend Shlomi, who is a fellow traveler and YouTuber about life as a Hasidic Jew, invited me into his own house, which is located outside of the city. How are you doing? Hi, Good to see you. These are the kids. Hi, how are you? That's the girl. It's approved on this channel now, but Twitch Automods stops people from saying stolen valor by default now. That's so funny. That's a boy, <laughs> the baby's a girl. My name is Shlomi Zayans. I was born in Borough Park, Brooklyn, New York. What is Hasidism to you? What does it mean? It's a very, very good question, a very deep question. I think Hasidism means a lot of things to a lot of different people. There are some people who are very focused on the inner Hasidism, which I, which I believe is the most important. Yeah, that's important. the plain guy that everyone was yelling at. And then it came out that he was like, kind of, you know, he was being kind of aggro by Israel, but people immediately yelled at him, not because he was being aggro by Israel, but because they suspected him of being aggro by Israel. And part of it, there was somebody named Yisrael Baal Shemtov. He lived in the 1700s in Ukraine. He felt that Judaism was getting a little bit dry. People weren't doing Judaism with enough passion. So he reinvented the whole... <sighs> Bro, I, that, that part is crazy to me. Like, 2,000 years? Bro, 2,000 years of tradition and then you just kind of have a guy who's like yeah we got to really spice it up a little bit and then it takes so much like it, it takes hold and people are just like completely aware that this is a, a a newer revisionist uh this is a newer revisionist it's like protestantism look at christian evangelicalism i guess yeah christian evangelism is like very very similar 
whole system of how we relate to God and how we interact with God and how Jews live. And, and many people would say that the Baal Shem Tov and the Hasidic movement saved Ashkenazi Judaism because there were so many people who would have fallen out if not for this new invigoration of life and excitement into the, into the Judaism. Interesting. You should make woke liberal Islam. That's literally what America thought it could do with Fethullah Gulen. That's not even a joke. Like, America was like, we kind of did, we kind of invested a little bit too hard into the, into like Wahhabist sects. So now as a counterbalance, we should literally tap into like Fethullah Gulen and try to create a network of schools in the exact opposite direction where it's like more tolerant and more liberal. And that was also a failure. Um, and, you know... So it didn't, it didn't work out at all. I've seen your YouTube channel, you're doing a great job. Thank traveling you. Traveling as a Hasidic Jew and what you're learning from it and taking us through your life, which is awesome. Keep it up, by the way. I'm gonna um, try. Is that controversial among the community? I have some very open-minded rabbis who feel that it's important for people to understand what Shabbos is. And therefore, it's not like we're doing this every week. On a one-time yeah. basis, yeah. we brought people in with special permission from rabbis. And that's what we're doing again this week. We got permission. Yeah, and it's very important to say that. So I just want to make it very clear that this Shabbos video that we are going to do today uh, was done with the permission of a rabbi. And anybody who's considering doing anything similar should please talk to their local rabbi. Bro, put a windsock, homie, what's happening? To make sure that this can be approved in a way that it goes in accordance with halacha, with Jewish law. I am about to do tefillin, which is a very... They are full of it like evangelicals do. Hasids are often found in strip clubs, sex clubs, brothels, etc. in New York City. Wait, really? No shot. Do they wear the drip? Like, do you take the, you don't take the fox hat to the strip club, you know what I mean? No shot. Because that, that find, that, I, I find it be strange if you're, like, doing that level of sin. Doing that level of sin while still, like, riding for the religion, you know what I mean? Very special experience in Judaism. I've done it maybe ten times in my life. I'm following oh, wow. the leader here. He's showing me what to do. Okay, so first of all, please lift up your left sleeve. Repeat after me. Baruch I, what, what is it? By the way, can someone explain what this is to me? I'm sure they will explain it, actually. Because, like, it does look kind of straight. It looks like a little mini Kaaba. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to come across as insensitive. It's a box with the scriptures. Tefillin is a prayer that involves a black leather box with leather straps containing I mean, scrolls sick. from the Torah. And then like this. And then this. Yes. And now we got it. All right. Okay. So, guide me. So, Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, 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 Echad. Now, I would just suggest if you want to say, you know, think about your family, pray yeah. for your loved ones, and okay. just have a moment. You can close your eyes, leave them open, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. It does look like the Kaaba. I'm not even kidding. By the way, we have to take the obligatory Tefillin selfie. Sure. We call them telfies. And uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I have to tell everyone that I wrapped Rubinsky. Yeah, of course. Please. Okay, so. I have a feeling what's in this box, and I feel like it's a hat. This is a hat. It's a very special hat. I told you, chat. See? Chat. I told you. They got cool-ass boxes for the hats, too. Hats are... Those hats are expensive, okay? Stramo. Stramo. Yeah, Stramo. 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 Perfect. This is a hat that Hasidic men wear on Shabbos. Oh my they are goodness. very expensive. This one, I believe, was $5,500. Legend has it, back in uh, the 1700s, or possibly even earlier in Poland, there was a king or a count or someone in power who told Jews that they couldn't wear fur. But he made one exception. They're allowed to wear fur from a tail, supposedly the lowest. The only time, the only time I've ever seen a hat box was when I was on a plane and I saw a Hasidic Jewish man with a hat box. I did not know that there were such things as hat box. This disrespectful, sure. cheapest part. So the Jews went and they made hats, completely made out of tails and beautiful hats. They rock them like this and every Shabbos, they tried to put us down and we lift ourselves up that with a stramo. So cool, now, I have one for you too. You have one for me? I'm gonna put it on your head. Yamaka stays on? I'm gonna crown you. Yamaka stays on. Okay. Yeah, what animal is it? Um, I think it's sable. You only wear this leading up to Shabbat, or do you wear it throughout? No, the you night? wear it throughout. Like, yeah, so, so I make kiddush, which is the blessing on, sure. on the wine. I'll wear it. Make hamaytzi, which is the blessing on the bread.
I feel like I've seen, dude, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like I've seen this hat not on, uh, you know, Shabbos or whatever. I feel like I see it on like on a Wednesday. You know what I mean? Some of these dudes are fucking rocking this to be like, listen, I fuck. A lot of people will wear it for the entire meal. It gets kind of heavy and kind of hot. Yeah. So like usually when I start eating soup, that's when my body heats up and then I take it off. You got a nice little like lean there. Is mine yeah. straight or is Your strip club is real? Yeah, I heard that uh, someone in the chat was also saying like strip club installs mechitza to attract Orthodox clientele. I did a little research on their lifestyle and we're moving forward with what I learned. New York, a local gentleman's club has erected a barrier to separate female patrons from the males in order to cater to Jewish males who adhere to stricter standards of modesty the most. I can't tell if this is a joke or not. Yeah, dude, this, this seems like, no, this is like, this is like the onion or something. I feel like you just sent me like the onion. Look. In New York City is never a joke. No, I think it's a it's a joke about I, I it it's I think it's probably a joke making fun of like the actual phenomena of Hasidic Jews going to strip clubs. There's a straight. I, I kind of like the curve. I like it too. It's like it's like the hood Hasidic, you know? <laughs> or hood Hasidic. <laughs> Take me to your right hand. Yes, sir. Ooh. That no, jacket is sick. Yes, you are. Oh, wow. Looking good. What is this called? It's called a bekasha. Bekasha. Now, what's now what's interesting is that it goes right over left. Oh. Okay. So, in Hasidic thought, the right side represents kindness, and the left side represents judgment. You always want to have the kindness over the judgment. Make sure that there's more kindness than judgment. So, we wear our clothing right over left. I like that. Good night, Shabbos. You don't have payas, but because you have the beard. I bought the I bought the Pope version of that that jacket. You kind of look like a new age modern chassid. If you didn't have a beard, then it would be harder to. Then people would be like, "Who's this guy?" But with the beard, yeah, you could pull it off. We're talking about all these um, things that happen on Shabbat, but for those who aren't Jewish or maybe don't know. Shabbat is a time that happens sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. So 20 Yeah, see, I had neighbors who were Hasidic. They would let me pay, uh, they would pay me to flip the lights on for them during Shabbat. It's called Shabbos Goy. Yeah. 24 hour period. Every 25 hours, actually. 25 hour period. Every single Friday to Saturday. No matter what. For existence, no matter what. Yeah. And during Shabbat, it's a time of relaxation, a time of family. And you don't, you're, you're not allowed to work. No cooking, no, no watering the no grass. Cooking, no watering. Like, just chill. Just chill. How yeah. much do you get Shabbat paid for that? I don't know, but it's like, it's, it's great. It's a cheat code. That's what I'm saying. You just feel the presence of showers. Can you shower? No. Can you shave? No. Can you brush your teeth? No. When you take a toothbrush and you put toothpaste on it, and most people put it under water as well, what's happening is that you're squeezing out water from between the bristles. And that's, you're not allowed to squeeze water out of anything on Shabbos. That's the problem with the teeth. It's not a hygienic thing, it's the water thing. So there's somebody who invented something called a Shabbos toothbrush. Rubber bristles where the water doesn't get converged within the bristles. And then when you use it, you're not squeezing out. Do you see what I'm saying? Is all, there's so many cheat codes. It's awesome. It's just like, it's just, it's just so like, it's so strange from the outside looking in. We are just like, what the hell is going on? But yeah. The flight gets canceled on Thursday and rebooked to Friday night. What do you do? I'm not going to be on that flight. Be on no that chance. Flight. Only if it's a life and death situation. Death. So God forbid, like if I had medication that could save someone's yeah. life at the other end of the world, I'd get on a plane yeah. and bring it to them. Anything short of life or death, Shabbos comes first. My, my baby was born on Shabbos. Really? Now, we went to the hospital before Shabbos because my wife was in labor earlier, but if we had to, yeah, we would just get but in the car and go to the hospital. Yeah, you got to... You gotta have a baby, you gotta have a baby. <laughs> you can have a baby at home, but, but most women aren't into that. So, it's Shabbat. This is a, a very meaningful time of the week. Is it usually just your family, or do you have guests come over? Um, so, we actually travel a lot, so like... Oh, you travel with him? Some of the time, yeah. Like, if it's like a really dangerous place, then I wouldn't go. You wouldn't go to Afghanistan or anything? No, I have three kids. Do you connect with other Jews on the road? Have you done that? Go to like Chabad's or any communities? For sure, we always go to Chabad. We kind of like rely on Chabad for like it's, restaurants. It is a lifeline. I've like, yeah. done the same. Yeah, like they're they're amazing. They really are. First of all, I hope you're like absolutely starving and did not eat anything today. I'm pretty hungry. Okay. <laughs>
good. So we have some baked asparagus, Hasselback. Wow, that looks fantastic. Um, some sweet baked chicken, sweet potato pie. We have some rice to go with the fish. This is chulent. Yep. Like a beef stew. Yep, yep, I've had chulent. Chicken soup, sorry. Wow. And here we have the beef wow. lasagna with Whoa. vegan cheese because we don't do milk and meat together. Right. We have the teriyaki salmon barbecue I ribs. This is insane. There is an unlimited. I'm telling you, dude, Chinese food is so important for Jewish people in America, okay? It's just like, it's so funny. It, it literally, it, it is, it is. It's just like, it's tradition. Like on Christmas specifically. And before you say teriyaki is Japanese or whatever, no, like specifically Chinese food, okay? Limited amount of food here. We got some grilled cauliflower. <laughs> Wait, why? Uh, Chinese uh, restaurants are open on Christmas. Literally. Roasted eggplant and vegetables. And we have hot apple pie and potato kugel. Wow, you've outdone yourself. Thank you. And some desserts over there. I'm kind of speechless. Most white Americans if won't deny or think about this. It's so integrated into Christmas that we just accept it that question. Food is also the reason. Is it always the same dishes? That's a very good question. So basically what we do is also, um, Chinese food doesn't have a lot of dairy. Has. We start off with wine, then fresh baked challah bread, then usually people will go fish, soup, and some kind of main dish with side dishes. Um, but you can be kind of like, you can freestyle with what kind of fish. And this goes without saying, obviously, everything is kosher, always, yeah. everything. Kosher is just a, a certain, it's kind of like halal, Muslim, it's similar. Yeah, so basically what it is is um, kosher is any animal that is slaughtered, has to be slaughtered by a rabbi who took specific training and try to eliminate the suffering of the animal while it's being killed. Um, we don't eat milk and meat together. We don't eat pork. pork. We don't eat shellfish. I'm so in it, I never miss anything else. Thank God we're eating very well. Wow. <laughs> so we're gonna go into the kitchen and wash the bread. Okay. And then we're gonna continue. Jews always wash each hand twice for ritual purity and actual cleanliness before reciting blessings and reciting Torah. Then they sing. <laughs> After that, they recite some prayers and take the first sip of wine, which everyone in the room drinks from the same cup. This big fluffy Jewish bread called challah always kicks off the it's Shabbat so dinner. Good. As far as like, I'm not like a big matzo ball soup guy, but freaking challah bread is so good. That I think is the most OP. Um, that is the 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 most OP like Jewish food item i think is so good it, it's then very very good keeps on coming if there's one thing that all jews have in common it is feeding you until you cannot breathe that's a good glass of wine oh thanks there's some left <laughs> no more i'm not ready how many days did it take you to cook this um definitely more than one all of yesterday all of yesterday wow Drinking alcohol is a big part of every Jewish dinner, and Shabbat is no exception. First to see the Shabbos. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Good Shabbos. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, you're going to have some water, okay? On a regular night at 8 p.m., what would I be doing? Maybe I'd be eating supper with my family. Maybe I'd be putting the kids to bed. 
But I wouldn't have the clarity and peace of mind to just stop everything being in the moment. When my boss is on my phone, on one phone, there's a second phone where someone else wants me, and everything's just all up in the air now. Like peaceful, relaxing. Ooh, chocolate babkas are sick too. That's another great one. The food kept on coming, but soon after, I cut the cameras out of respect for Shabbat. I ended up staying at Shlomi's house a few hours into the night, and it was a wonderful experience to say the least. As a Jew and someone who has celebrated Shabbat in many countries around the world, I must say that this one was the most special, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to take you guys along on my quest. Wait, was that in the permanent hell? Hold on say that this one was the most special and who has celebrated Shabbat in many countries around the world. Oh my I must God. say that this one was- Wait, is he in front of the- Is he in front of what I think he's in front of in that photo? The, the never ending fire pit? Uh, what is it called? The Hell's Gate? Gateway to Hell? That's such a funny photo. Soy facing- uh, Soy facing outside the gates of hell. Chat, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, what was this, like a coal mine or something? And they thought they could just, like, blow it up and then light it on fire. And then it, the, the fire would uh, take out all of the natural gas. There's a natural gas deposit. And then it never stopped. So, this is a hole that has been permanently on fire for the past like 70 years. Oh, not 70, since 1980, I guess. On the world, I must say that this one was the most special and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to take you guys along on my quest to learn all about Hasidic culture, the good and the bad. As uncomfortable as it may be to witness how women and LGBT folks are treated by this community or how sad it is that most kids do not practice speaking. I think um, he specifically did a video on women in, uh, in Hasidic culture English too. At home, nor have access to a well-rounded education. It's important to remember He's right, though. Like, the education part is, like, really crazy. Apparently, they have diverted funds away from public schools um, directly back into, like, uh, these, like, Jewish community schools, like, Hasidic uh, schools specifically. And, and it seems as though, according to the New York Times, yeah, no mention how they steal $1 billion in New York City public full, uh, school funds and barely teach their kids English or any core subjects is Yiddish. 1,000 kids took state standardized tests and 100 of them failed, 100% of them. It's borderline, a borderline cult abuse shit. Nobody talks about it. Important context so people don't think it's just some harmless insular community. So that is like, that is definitely one of the uh, genuine, insane uh, aspects of the uh, Hasidic community. He, th that chatter is aggro, but he's 100% right. Okay, there is no, there's no two ways about it. And the way I'll describe it to you is by um, making a comparison to Christian schools. This is something that happens with Christian homeschooling as well. Betsy DeVos literally was the secretary of education, if you recall. This is basically what she did in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Michigan, right? Like, it's identical. It is identical. And it is completely unacceptable, completely inappropriate, absolutely ridiculous. In Hasidic enclaves, failing private schools flush with public money. New York's Hasidic Jewish religious schools have benefited from $1 billion in government funding in the last four years, but are unaccountable to outside oversight. So, it's really, really, really bad. And it's it completely, completely unacceptable. It's also really hostile towards women who want divorce, suffer from domestic abuse, especially since the lack of resources in the community backing successfully remove themselves in their household. Yeah. So, you know, as, as like, uh, there's definitely the, the other side of this as well, is what I'm saying. There, there's definitely uh, the, the uh, negative side of this as well, for sure. So it's not all just like haha -ha, fun stuff uh, and and crazy.
But the tunnel thing, on the other hand, well, tunnels are cool. Remember where Hasidic Jews come from and how they came to be, which explains why they hold on to a lifestyle that seems so backwards to the rest of us. In many ways, Hasidic Judaism can be looked at as a miracle. For a group of a half million... <laughs> This chatter has been saying this nonstop. The tunnels are a cover-up for the truth. The earth is hollow, and you know it. You know what, chatter? You might be right, okay? You might be right. I think the Hasidic community uncovered a deep, dark secret of the earth, which is that the earth is hollow.